Hello, my name is Rafael Groman. I'm uh, an assistant professor in communication at the Unicinos University and coordinator of DigiLabor Research Lab. I would like to welcome you to the second webinar of our seminar entitled Automation and Digitalization in Contemporary Capitalism. The seminar is jointly uh, organized by three research groups in different Brazilian university, universities, namely the research group in the political economy of development at the Federal University of Rio Grande, Rio Grande do Norte, the research group in, econ in, in economy, society and technology, NETS, at the Federal University of Ceará, and the DigiLabor Research Lab at the Unicinos University. And today, our guest speaker is Paul Cookshot, who kindly accept our invitation to present and discuss on the complexity order of economic planning. He is a computer scientist, economist, and a reader and leading researcher, uh, and reader at the University of Glasgow, and leading researcher uh, on things about uh, economic planning, Marxism, and uh, algorithms. And he wrote the following books, Towards a New Socialist, Arguments for Socialism, Comp Computation and Its Limits, and his new book, How the World Works, the, the story of human labor from prehistory to the modern day. So we will start with Paul Cockshot's presentation and afterwards we will have a Q&A session. So welcome, uh, Paul Cockshot. Thank you very much for having us uh, today. And the floor is totally yours. yours. Thank you. I must apologize that there's no picture of me the camera isn't working, but we do have my lecture material. I'm going to first give you a bit of the historical background of the debate, and then I'll look at some experimental research work that I've done over the last three years into this topic. The basic issue is whether an economy should have calculation in kind or in money. In the period just after the First World War, the left-wing Austrian economist Neurath advocated that socialist economy had to learn from war economy. He said that in war economy, you had to do calculations in kind, that to survive, states had had to prioritize physical production of key raw materials, labor, foodstuffs, etc. And he pro proposed this as the model for socialist planning. Now, given the political circumstances in Austria at the time, the immediate aftermath of the Russian Revolution, a very strong social democratic or socialist movement in Austria, this was seen as a big threat in uh, Vienna at the time. So you have other Austrian school economists coming out against him. The, the most uh, best known in this were von Mises and Hayek, and the first off the mark was von Mises. And he argued that only money provided a rational basis for comparing costs, because essentially his argument is you have to see which is the most economically efficient way of doing something. Unless you've got money, you can't compare two different uh, types of cost in different units of production, different means of production. And he rejected calculation in terms of labor time because he said millions of equations would have to be solved. Hayek went on to argue that the market is like a telephone exchange system and it, it exchanges the information necessary to tie up the economy and that only the market can solve the problem of dispersed information. At this time, we're talking about the 20s and 30s, um, mathematicians started to work on it. Uh, the first guy off the mark was Robert Remack, a German mathematician um, who came up with a proposal to set, a, this was at the height of the Great Recession, he came up with a proposal to operate the German economy um, 
at prices which are roughly equivalent to Marx's labor values. And he showed that this, that you could do the calculations for this, he said, using electromechanical calculation. Von Neumann came up with an alternative thing because he, he didn't agree with the um, approach of using labor values. He was not a socialist. Uh, but he, his model of economic growth and economic planning really only makes sense in the context of a, a planned economy because of it. He has this uniform growth path, uh, which, again, has to be seen in the light of the uh, early Soviet planning, which was going on at the time. Um, von Neumann was using uh, linear algebra to do this. It, it comes just after he's written the foundations of quantum mechanics, which again uses linear algebra techniques, and he, he takes the quantum mechanic techniques to the economy. And the most general solution came from Leonard Kantorovich, working in the Soviet Union, who came up with what later known came to be known as linear programming. Now let's look at the scale of the problem of doing this. In the mid-1950s, God's plan in, in Russia could prepare detailed material balances, that is to say the kinds of calculations that Neurath was talking about, for some 3,000 products. But by the late 60s, there were several million distinct products in the Soviet economy. And the actual staff of God's plan was quite small. People think of the Soviet Union as having a vast bureaucracy, but it had only three or 4,000 civil servants working in Gosplan. So they couldn't handle more than that. Now let's think of it as a computational task. Suppose you've got a million products and each product uses, let's say on average, 200 other components in its manufacture. You can define any production process then as a list of pairs saying the product code of the input followed by the amount of the input you're going to need to um, produce one unit of output. And if each of those take two full words of computer memory, you would need, say, 400 million words of memory to do it, or, say, 1.5 gigabytes of memory. That doesn't sound much to us now. Ideally, you'd have wanted 1.5 gigabytes of fast RAM. At a pinch, you could have done it with hard disks. By the late 70s, America had CDC drives up to 300 megabytes. Now, we're, we're used to thinking of drives now in, in hundreds of gigabytes, but these were hundreds of megabytes were the best that could be done. But there were embargoes on export of uh, this kind of equipment to the USSR. In addition, you would have needed at least one million words of fast RAM. And the best US technology didn't reach this level until 1975. And those would certainly not have been exportable, the craze of the time. There were, there were explicit bans on the export of that equipment. But all of this can be easily done on modern computers. Even laptops have enough memory. In what follows, I'm going to present experiments, look at how complex the calculations are. And I've actually released the software, uh, the software on GitHub, which uh, gives a pair of packages for preparing end year plans. One of them uses Kantorovich's approach. The other uses the harmony method that we advocated in towards a new socialism. On SourceForge, I have, those were released about, <laughs> perhaps two years ago, SourceForge, at the end of last year, I released a third package that was written in the new programming language, Julia, and uses Leontiev's planning techniques. So let's look at Kantorovich style planning. If you're going to use it, uh, it's a Java program. You say Java planning, any year plan after you've installed the stuff, and then give it a set of um, spreadsheets and the spreadsheets to make them easy to edit and read are all in comma separated value form and then it produces as output the plan 
Now let's look at the spreadsheets you need because one needs to decide on a standard way of feeding the information in. And I, I took spreadsheets both because they're easy to edit and work with, but also because your starting point, suppose you wanted to do some prospective macroeconomic plans for Brazil. Your starting point is going to be the Brazilian IO tables, and those are published in spreadsheet forms. So people working in any country can at least start off with spreadsheet form tables. And if you don't know how to read a spreadsheet, this then Leontia format, their column oriented um, tables where a column shows the output or the, that shows the iron industry to produce 10 units of output. It says I'll use 0.1 unit of iron, two units of coal, 0.3 units of labor, etc. And for every industry in the economy, ideally you have a column like that and the rows tell you how much is used up. But that's not enough if you're doing realistic planning. That is the way the I.O. tables are typically published, but you have to go beyond that if you're going to do some planning. You, you need to know what the capital stock that was used to, to produce these outputs are. So ideally, I mean, again, I'm using a highly artificial economy. I'm, it's based on sort of Sraffa's type of model that you've got um, a table here with the same format, which says, to produce the 10 units of iron, I needed a fixed capital stock of 10 units of iron. And to, for the coal industry, there was a fixed capital stock of 10 units of iron, okay? And th these different types of capital goods have different depreciation rates. So there's another table which specifies the depreciation rate, which I show as being, say, a 14-year depreciation rate for iron, which is typical of um, the, you know production machinery. Uh, for things which are consumed during the process of the, the production very quickly, I'm saying the production rate, the depreciation rate is 0.5, so it's much faster. But you can set this to whatever levels you want in the tables. And then the final table gives you the targets. How many units of iron, how much of coal, how much corn, bread, labor, etc. So everything is in spreadsheet format and everything is in a readable, readable format to work with. The software then translates your plan, which had specified the technologies, existing capital stocks, etc., and the targets say how much labor you want employed each year. Okay, so in the, this case, I'm showing the labor supply gradually going up. Um, you, the, the software then translates this into linear programming format. So let's take an example of this. What we're saying is we've got, we're going to maximize plan target fulfillment for each year. Okay, the, the sum of plan target fulfillment over all those years. And we have what you can either call a Kantorovich plan ray or Leontie of demand function, which says, okay, the plan fulfillment for year one must at least meet the a certain level of final consumption of iron given in the targets. It must at least meet uh, a, a level of, of production of coal, etc. And there are then resource constraints have to be put in for the linear program. You have to say, for example, there's a, the, the labor available for year one has got to be greater than equal to the labor used in every industry. And you can set a a con external constraint that the labor available for year one is less than or equal to three, which we got from the tables. And the other constraints are set by the capital stock um, and the flows in the table. So you get a vast number of equations, which are the constraints implied by the input output table structure. And you then link the years together by means of the capital stocks from one year to the next. So basically, the important thing here is to say for each type of capital stock for every year, it says the capital stock made up of coal in year two is going to be set by the capital stock made up of coal in year one, less depreciation in coal of pr production of year one, 
and plus the accumulation of whatever that good is. Okay, now the, the names coal, iron, etc. I'm just doing for example. Um, if you had a real I/O table, these would be the names of the actual uh, industries in the um, I/O table. Though you'd probably have to make sure that there were no spaces in the names. But it's clear that if you're going to do this kind of thing, the the, the mathematical problem must be tractable. If you have 100 industries, this method may work. But if you increase to a, a million, it might be prohibitively slow. And all of this is being done using the open source uh, linear programming package LPSOLV, which is the same underlying engine as you would have in a spreadsheet using LibreOffice, for example. It's an open source package which you can easily install. And the plan program generates the LP solve program, which you then feed into LP solve to solve it. The problem with this is that it's polynomial time. Um, here's a, a graph showing the number of sectors in the economy. And this is the time in seconds that it takes to compute the plan. This was done on a 50 pound computer, just to show what you could do with a very small computer, um, a 50 pound Odroid computer. And as as you scale up here, you see it's a constant slope on a log log graph. Therefore, it's a polynomial function. And if you look at the slope of the polynomial function, you see it's roughly a polynomial of order three, which is fine. Here we can go up for a, a five year plan for roughly 100 sectors, which is typical of most published I.O. tables, you can do it in a few hundred seconds. Not a serious problem. And as I say, this is on a 50 pound uh, computer, which uses the same kind of chip as you've got in your mobile phone. So this is fine for strategic national economic planning, using the level of detail that's already available in currently published economic statistics. If you are wanting to apply this stuff in Brazil, your main problem would be to get good estimates of the capital stocks in the different industries, because um, not all countries publish good broken down data on the capital stocks in different industries. And you would also need to get information on the actual depreciation rates of different types of capital in different industries. But it's far too slow for um, large plants. So for 500 industries, use, fitting that uh, complexity order takes 17 hours for a five year plan, 2.2 uh, years for a 5,000 5, industry, for 50,000 industries, 2,000 years. Obviously, this is impossible. And this is the kind of reasoning that um, you get Alec Nove saying that detailed planning at the Soviet scale is impossible. That's because of the type of algorithm they're using. We were aware of that when we wrote towards a new program, uh, towards a new socialism. And we developed a near linear algorithm before the book came out. I originally developed that in 1989, but I had long since lost the source code we used for the experiments. So there's a new version of this written in Java on GitHub, and you can look at the GitHub address for it there. How do we know that the log linear solution must exist? Given that any explicit calculation or algorithm that humans can do can also in principle be done by computers. Given also that the complexity order of an algorithm doesn't change depending on whether it's people do it by hand or a computer does it, it follows that the existence of a functioning market economy is proof that low complexity order applies to economic co coordination algorithms. If it were not the case, the ability of large economies involving millions of people to coordinate themselves by the market would be impossible. 
they clearly can't um, have algorithms of the order of n to the third, or they'd never be able to produce the hundreds of millions of products that Amazon actually has on sale. So the actual complexity orders of the calculations that are being done in a market economy must be much lower. And the harmony algorithm was designed to mimic these kinds of um, calculations. It was designed to be n log n, and I'd previously shown it to be n log n on single year plans. Basic idea is you've got a this harmony function which is taken from neural nets and it's designed to mimic the principle of positive but diminishing marginal social utility. You want a function whose value rises as planned fulfillment approaches, but which rewards over fulfillment less than it punishes under fulfillment. So here's a, the type of shape you want. If that is the planned target, two, two units of output, and if you're producing less than two units of output, it, the, you go into negative territory here. It's zero exactly when you're on planned target. When you're above planned target, it's positive, but the slope is lower so that you are rewarding that less. The actual function I use in the um, code I've released is this, um, basically for the positive part, it's a log function. For the negative part, it's um, a, a second order polynomial. And S is, this, is the level of surplus being produced relative to the target. Now, the advantage of it, of it is, firstly, that it's more flexible with respect to planned targets in that it rewards over fulfillment, yet it punishes short, shortfalls. And because the function has a continuous first derivative, it allows the, well, it's a continuous first derivative except at point zero, which is a, a, a bit of a problem with it. Um, you can use other functions for that that are continuous. Because it has a, in over most places, it's, it's, it's got a derivative, you can use Newton's method of approximation. So let's look at Newton's method. Um, this is the harmony function, this is the output, there's your planned target, and we know it'll pass through zero at the planned target. So we've drawn the harmony function there, passing through zero. Suppose we've got two industries, A, which is over-fulfilling, and B, which is under-fulfilling. We, in order to meet our target is that they all should have the same degree of harmony. So we want to reduce A and increase B and the resources of labor and means of production released by the reducing the output of A will go towards increasing output of B. And since you've got the gradients, you can use Newton's method to find the intersection with the mean. But since these overshoot, you, you, you reduce by a little less than that, say reduce by half. And if you do this you, at the second stage, you've brought these two things closer together and you've got a new mean, but it's, it tends to be below the original uh, mean you had before. So it converges on the mean, but shifts down. So you need a separate stage, which slides the mean up along the harmony function. And what I've done is I use the marginal harmony gain as a dummy, dummy rate of profit. So we shift resources to the industry where the marginal harmony gain is highest. Essentially, we're using the derivative of the harmony function of each product as a sharp shadow price and computing a, a rate of return for each technique on that. Um, it can lead to instabilities if industries have negative harmony gain. Uh, so there are ways, I, I borrow another technique from neural nets, which basically says I clamp the possible values into a sigmoid function and that, that stabilizes it. You, you'd, the, if you download the software, there's detailed accounts of the maths used. 
Let's look at some results, though. This is the time that you get, the time curve you get using um, LP solve. This is the time curve you get using the harmony function. And you see that the harmony function has much more tractable results. OK, the, if we take the log of the slope, it's uh, close to one. So it's a much, much better close to linear um, complexity function. I've also released a Pascal version as well as a Java function. This is on a slightly faster computer, still a very cheap computer. However, if we scale it up, we find that the Java one does better on large uh, prob problems. We, if I give this time in seconds here, I, have, I haven't run it for these large problems, but just taking the complexity order and, and projecting forward, it implies that you could do the 10 million product economy in roughly two hours on a, a, a very cheap PC. The problem for, with a very cheap PC is it doesn't have enough memory. So you need to have a much more expensive PC to do it. Um, this obviously, I have been able to use two CPU cores to do a five year plan in under 10 minutes, which LP solve would have taken 2,400 years. The big problem is that what slows everything down is reading the data in, because I've done everything in terms of spreadsheets, and most of the spreadsheets are zeros once you get to a highly disaggregated table. So you're reading in lots of zeros, and you spend most of the time reading the stuff from files. If you were actually going to use this in anger, this kind of algorithm. You'd obviously keep data in relational database form, not as spreadsheets. You'd also paralyze the algorithm if you're going to handle millions of products. But if you're going to do a production quality system for detailed national plans, it's not something that can done, be done by an, an academic amateur in their spare time. You would have to uh, hire a, a proper software team to complete all parts of the pa of the package. And you'd need serious computing resources. Um, there's the, the GitHub um, package that you've got to go to. The next way is to look at combining Leontiev style planning with Harmony planning. Now, the advantage of Leontiev style planning is that it works directly from the IO tables. And you only need the Harmony stuff for doing the multi-year aspect of it so this is on you can get this from sourceforge and i give a detailed theoretical account of the maths in a pdf file and i give two example programs leontiev another initially russian mathematician started out in the soviet union later emigrated to america and he allowed planning to be treated as a branch of matrix analysis. And he subsequently had a big impact on Marxist economics. For instance, the work of Morishima is heavily based on Leontiev. Now, in the example I've released for the Julia system, I actually take not a toy IO table. I take the most compact version of the European Union's IO table for 2006. And I've broken it. I've taken one which, which has only got four or five sectors because that's the most I can show on the screen for lectures. OK, and this, these are actual data from the European Union. So it's highly aggregated for demonstration purposes. And I regularize the structure to be in a more Marxian form. So again, that's the output of agriculture used in agriculture and the figures are in millions of euros they're not in physical terms uh, Leontiev gives his since he's dealing with industry aggregates he gives the stuff in in units of money 
the only country I know of that publishes physical I.O. tables or has published physical I.O. tables recently is Germany. So anyone, this is, there's some complexity in how you deal with foreign trade, which I discuss in the documentation of the paper. So and that's out exports of industrial products. So with the ONTF and Morishima and all Marxian economics following Morishima, everything is done in terms of the A matrix, which is basically the matrix which tells you how much of each input you need to produce one unit of output. So each cell AIJ says what fraction of a euro's worth of input I was used to make one euro worth of output J. That is the, the so the ONTF Morishima format. So you don't have an output row, it's implicit. Suppose we specify the gross output as a column vector O. Then you can simply compute the vector of intermediate products required to meet this by a simple matrix multiplication. You multiply the gross output vector by the A matrix and you get the vector of resources that you're going to need to do that. Um, this is just demonstrating that if I take the, the, the European A matrix, I set the actual gross output for 2006 as a column vector, I multiply them together, I get the matrix of intermediate products that were actually used in Europe that year. You can also work out how much is going to be available for, for final consumption, obviously by subtracting A dot O from the gross output, and that'll leave you F, the net, net output. This, this is all Leontiev's maths. Um, now, if we try that in Julia, we get an error. Why do we get an error? What's wrong? It's because we, our A matrix has six rows and five columns, and it's not a square matrix. We have a labor input row, but we've got no labor output row, because in the capitalist economy, it's not slavery, and there's no industry producing labor power. What we can do is just put a, a column vector of zeros in there because there's no industry producing labor power, but logically we need a labor power sector. So it, we're saying there's, we want zero gross production of labor power and this industry is all zeros. After that, it works. And it, gives us a negative final consumption of labor power, which is the actual employment. I can type in that, that formula and get this answer. So this is the nice thing about Julia is it both of it's an extremely high performance language. It compiles stuff and runs it very fast, but it's also interactive. So it's very good for working with this kind of economic data. Um, I remove the negative labor value and compare it with what the the true out, true um, output is, and we get that. Ah, sorry, I'm using a new formula here. I'm dividing through by I minus A. I'm dividing that into F to get the uh, gross output. It's all standard Marxian Leonti of economics from the 50s. Next problem is how do you link up a sequence of years to form a five-year plan? Um, I did say Julia, like Octave or Euler, makes it very easy to do these calculations. Now, we've got, this is a basic Leontiev relationship. We have output is equal to AO plus F. This is the net use of resources plus the final product. And it therefore means that to, Achieve a given final product of F, 
we have to have an output of O minus AO. Um, if we take O as a common factor, we can express it as that. But we can then calculate what output, gross output, would be required to meet a given F. So final product, we can require the gross output required for any given pattern of consumption. And here I've done it by giving it using a, a matrix inversion because this is an inverse term going into the equation. So this is the matrix format we've used so far. When you move into time, you have to move from a matrix format to a tensor format. So you've got an IO table here or an A matrix here, but you have to have an A tensor for the um, time extended version of it and previously had an output vector and you have an output matrix that extends backwards into the time axis so in addition you have a capital stock tensor and an investment tensor and the capital stock tensor is going to be the integral of the investment tensor convolved with the depreciation function that's to say the stock in year n is a sum of investment in years one to n weighted, weighted by depreciation. And you can choose to either use a linear depreciation function or a negative exponential depreciation function. One way or the other, you can use either. If a society invests in means of production this year, it increases its future consumption potential at the expense of this year's consumption. The issue is how do you balance these? The solution I used when dealing with the Kantorovich planning was just to um, maximize total consumption over n years. But what you find when you, if you look in detail at the plans you get, is that they tend to impose a big cut in consumption in year one in order to get the investment to raise it in future years. This is notoriously what happened in early Soviet planning. This is uh, real wages from Allen's uh, book in the Soviet Union. This other curve is one that I computed from, sorry, this is Allen's real wages, the black curve. The dotted one is my estimate of child nutrition in the Soviet Union done by convolving um, adult heights with the child growth rate and that you see they fit very well but the important thing is in both cases it shows a sharp decline in consumption um, for about three or four years in order to, to achieve a rapid growth of course once the war starts everything falls again but you want that is that's too extreme and again the the harmony function comes in as a way of dealing with this. In this case, I've used a different harmony function, but it's got the same general shape. Um, because my friend Alan pointed that out that my previous harmony function didn't have a continuous first derivative. So we try to maximize the sum of harmonies of all years. So how do you calculate the harmony for one year as opposed to um, the product in a year. You can either take the mean of the harmonies of all industries or you take the lowest harmony of all industries. Um, I find that the taking the lowest harmony for that year is the better approach. You, the next thing you have when doing planning is you say you're going to do a five-year plan. So how are you optimizing on future years? If you're not careful and you put this into an algorithm, the algorithm will compute that the best thing to do is to use up all your stocks as fast as possible in the last three years because it doesn't think it's going to need any capital stocks the year after that. So it allocates nothing for investment in the last two or three years. 
um, the what you have to do is actually set your plan. If you want a five year plan, you have to make it five plus N years where the N is your depreciation horizon. So you plan for the future beyond the uh, five years that you're actually planning in detail to prevent the thing running down capital stocks at the end of the period. Um, again, this is a set similar sort of thing, Newtonian conversion uh, algorithm, um, and it, it iterates until we get the uh, either a maximum number of attempts or the coefficient of variation of harmony falls below a threshold. That's to say, you've moved the harmony over the years as close as possible. Again, driven by the same kind of data as before, an IO table, an IO flow table, capital stock table, depreciation rate, and the labor and targets file. Again, same sort of format. Uh, that's the labor available in year two. That's final consumption of agriculture in year four. And next, come to the performance issues. Leontiev defines it in terms of performing a matrix inversion. But in the problem with the matrix inversion is equivalent to matrix multiplication. And again, that's got a complexity order of n to the third, and you don't want to do that. In practice, you can deal with this using a linear solver. And the language, Julia, has got a very efficient matrix multiply system, an efficient, uh, uh, a good quality matrix inverse, but it's got an even better quality uh, linear solver. So it, instead of writing it like that, if you write it like that, it invokes the linear solver and the linear solver runs very much faster. The great majority of the elements of a huge input output table will be zero. This allows the matrix to be stored in sparse form. Again, a nice feature of the Julia programming language is it has good support for sparse matrices. And you can do matrix algebra using sparse matrices in a way which it's completely transparent to you whether the matrix is sparse or non-sparse. You use the same formula. Now, what do we know about the sparseness of, of actual economies? Well, this is work done by one of my PhD students on the, the US economy, applying, taking the most disaggregated version of the US IO table and successively aggregating it down from its from 440 or so industries right down to just a handful of industries. And if you then move upwards, the vertical scale is a number of new non-zeros in the table that occur as you expand the number of industries. And these grow proportional to the number of sectors initially, but then it levels off and becomes almost a constant. Now, this is something important. In order to get performance measures, I work by simulating a much larger economy. I take the European economy and I get successively disaggregated version, hypothetical disaggregated versions of the European economy. Disaggregated in such a way that if you re-aggregated them, they would be the same economy. But by you introduce occasional zeros in the table. So if we take this cell here, it expands out to four cells, a couple of zeros, and these two are um, actual halves of this number. So if you re-aggregate it, you get the same thing. Now, we know that this is that if you re-aggregate, you get to the same thing, but we get successively more zeros as we successively disaggregate. So if we take pictures of the IO table and we have a black pixel wherever you have a non-zero value, you see that as you get it bigger and bigger and bigger, the more and more zeros, which are, are shown as white, and the Julia um, 
system, I have taken it up to a matrix by 7,000 on an edge, okay? 7,000 on an edge, well, that's uh, 35 million, is it? Yeah, 35 million elements in the fully populated matrix, but far less in the sparse matrix. Uh, this is the number of cells in the matrix, uh, and this is the time to, to run it, and a matrix 7,000 square on the edge. I'm able to solve the problem in less than a second. Again, very much faster than we were doing before. And the time to solve is roughly linear with the non-zeros in the matrix. So I've assumed n log n growth in non-zeros in past papers. I did that because this comes from a theor theorem of Erdos that in a random graph, um, if you have n log n um, average fan out, you'll get a fully connected graph. The other possibility is that the economy is what's known as a small world graph. And these are common in social networks, airline networks, and things like that. In which case, the number of non-zeros grows even slower. It grows sort of like KN, which is the best scenario. Now, if we look at this graph, it appears that this has got a, this is the US economy. It appears to have small world properties, which is the best possible scenario for socialist planning. Um, it's worth having a look at the work of this guy, Hardin. Uh, he has gone beyond the scale that I'm dealing with. Um, he's got models of up to 10 to the 8 non-zeros in the A matrix. And he finds he can, he is using full linear programming, using more modern linear programming techniques and LP solve uses. So his is the soundest stuff. And he's able to solve full linear programming um, of that size in under 10 to the four seconds, which is say uh, under three hours on an eight gigabyte machine. If we had a K of 150, this corresponds to economies with the order of one million products. And if he ran it, in, if instead of doing it in a, um, a little cheap laptop, he was using a, a decent multi-core machine, he could easily scale it up to the level of the full Soviet economy. And th what's important about this is he's actually using Kantorovich's style uh, linear programming, except using much more modern linear programming algorithms than Kantorovich. I think this is the end of my talk. I'll stop there. Great. Thank you very much, Professor Paul Cookshot. Uh, we have some questions uh, to you. The first of one is from Caio Fernandes. Uh, how do you see the, the, the possibilities and potentials to use this kind of new computational tools for supporting new and more efficient industrial policies, especially on underdeveloped countries. Manual planning techniques. The, the Soviets were able to achieve very rapid uh, rates of growth. And if you, that's easily doable in times of, of or in circumstances where you have a relatively underdeveloped economy and you still have considerable reserves of labor power. And the question then is, how do you accelerate the, cap the accumulation of capital stock in the right sectors in order to meet these needs? The level which you can apply these algorithms is initially at the level of the um, IO tables. If you had a socialist government elected in Brazil, you could apply this kind of planning to say the 100 industry sector level almost immediately from the data you've got available um, from the IO tables. But it does demand that the, the state is able to direct investment. You can't do this or expect to be able to do this kind of planning if you're relying on market incentives. 
the state has to be at least able to exercise the degree of control of aggregate investment that the Chinese government is able to uh, exercise. So an initial level would be at the, the sort of um, IO table level disaggregation. Sorry, the 100 sector disaggregation, which the IO tables have. Great. Uh, the next question, I always speak uh, so slowly, uh, is from Fabrizio Pitombo Leite. Uh, considering that Brazilian official release data does not include capital stock estimates, do you think word input output database could do the trick? I don't know enough of the world input output database to know whether that's the case. I would have thought that the world input output databases probably is probably based on data already published by national statistical agencies. Um, there is work published uh, by some Chinese economists in the World Review of Political Economy, where they construct um, detailed capital stock uh, tables for China using only published data and doing various types of inference to work out what the likely um, infills are for the parts they don't know, don't have details on. But the more you, you do of that, the less accurate your plan is going to be. I mean, the, 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 to do well, you need the National Statistical Agency to try and collect good data on capital stock. I mean, in principle, it may, no, just com company accounts isn't enough. You need to know what format the capital stock was in. I mean. The, the British uh, embassy in East Berlin in uh, late early 50s, late 40s, is reported to have said that the East Germans had such detailed capital stocks that they knew where every machine tool was. I mean, that's ideally the level you needed. Great. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Rodrigo Santaella. Uh, Rodrigo asks, in your work, Professor Paul Cockshot, you have always discussed the attempts at economic planning in the USSR, demonstrating its technical and political limits and pointing that it would have been possible to advance further in a socialist planet economy with the technology available since the 70s and also showing that today it's possible to plan on a large scale with the level of technology available. I would like you to comment on other socialist experiences that, that try economic planning in 20th century, like China, Chile, and Cuba. More specifically on how technology was used to make them work. Problem with that is I really don't have enough information about what is done in Cuba or what is currently done in China. The stuff from Chile has been published um, and Stafford Beer reports on it in his book. The, the problem with that is that it was cybernetics in the sense of military command and control. Well, of course, the, the whole field of cybernetics arose out of military command and control. And that is not quite the same as economic planning. It's good for crisis management, but it's not actually the same as long-term planning. It's It was very good for dealing with acting quickly and dealing with uh, ongoing crisis. And if you look at the, the systems that we designed, they were all based around um, the techniques that were developed for air defense systems. 
the the projection of information in real time, the groups of pe of commanders making decisions, pressing buttons to come up with the decisions. Well, the pressing buttons was new, but it was all uh, based on experience of military techniques. And I'm not convinced that that is adequate for long-term planning. Thanks. The next question is from uh, Rafael de, de Acipreste. What are the main problems in planning with IO tables expressed in monetary terms? How do, how to estimate capital in physical quantities? That, that, that's a very real issue um, because the most immediate requirement for planning at the moment is to meet ecological concerns. And the monetary IO tables that the governments publish don't actually give you the kind of physical details that you require to know about how many, how much carbon dioxide is being used up in a given process, for example. So although the, the monetary data gives you magnitudes of interaction, they're not broken down into physically meaningful units. The, as I say, the German IO tables uh, were published in triplicate form. They published them in, I don't know if they still do this, but when Carlsen Stamher was uh, in charge, they used to publish them in money form, physical unit terms, and time terms, amount of labor hours. Uh, that would have been much better. But I, I think there's, if you are wanting to do it now, there is clearly got to be a great deal of effort put into preparing realistic estimates of how much is, is physically being used in a given industry. Now, you can do this, for instance, if you take the energy industries and you can look at flows of um, oil into the electricity industry. It's not too difficult to go from the monetary flows of oil into millions of tons of oil equivalent. And if you, certainly for Britain, if you look at the, the, the statistics published by the Department of Energy, in addition to the statistics published by the, the Treasury or, or the um, National Economic Statistics, you, you can start to get a handle on that. But it, it, it requires teamwork of quite a lot of people working together to do it. Thank you very much. The next question is mine. Uh, Professor, other uh, economists uh, in, in the few week, in the few years, have taken up the issue of socialist economic planning in relation to the role of the algorithms, such as Michael Rosowski in the book The People's Republic of Walmart, and Aaron Benanav, our next uh, uh, speaker here in the book uh, Automation and the Future of Work, uh, speaking about uh, uh, the role of algorithms in socialist economic planning. How does your work dialogue or related with their work? I'm afraid I haven't, I've, I know of Lee Phillips' work in the People's Republic of Walmart. I don't know of the, the other work. Um, I think there's a. I don't think there's any contradiction between what Alan Cottrell and I have written and what Lee Phillips has written. But I don't know about the the the, the second author you mentioned. The other. Great. Uh, the, the other um, author is Aaron Benanav. It, his book is very good too. Could you type it into the screen, sir? Okay. There's a message. Okay. Uh, the, the next question is from Fabricio Pitombo Leite. Apart from computational limitations, what do you think about an angle type a structural change of consumption patterns, as in Pazinet, for planning simulation purpose? I'm afraid I don't understand the question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the people have one more question. Esther, do you have questions? Yeah. 
Do you have I would, I would have a question uh, regarding the more general discussion you have on on modes of production or what it means mode of, of production. If you could uh, talk a little bit more when you, you uh, highlight or you focus on the role of the productive forces and not relations of production. You okay. you talk a lot that uh, electricity or sync energy or that finally computation would be the basis for other modes of production. Well, I think if you go and look in capital by what just to, to see where Marx uses the term mode of production. I suggest you get a copy of a PDF file of capital and find all the currencies of the phrase mode of production. You will find that the great majority, he is talking about the mode of material production. He's not talking about relations of production. The idea that a mode of production is a combination of relations and forces of production comes from Stalin's book, Dialectical and Historical Materialism. And after that came out in the 1930s, that was became the, the standard interpretation in the Soviet Union. And it, from there, it became the standard interpretation of what Marx meant by that in the West. But I don't think that's what Marx actually means. Um, he, he talks about transformations of the mode of production within capitalist relations of production. So he talks of a um, that capitalist relations of production first take hold of production and impo impose a formal subordination of labor to capital, where people are formally dependent on um, wage labor. But that formal dependent is only brought about by the fact that they happen through historical circumstances of being driven off the land to be forced to sell their labor power. In principle, the, the form of physical production which existed was such that they could still, with a change in ownership, have still carried out individual production. And the mode of production doesn't change until the physical form of the means of production are changed into machine industry. And once that physical form of production is changed, then you have the real subordination of labor because it becomes impossible for the individual worker to own and control the, the actual material means of production. And that is, that's what he means by the mode of production. So I'm just trying to emphasize th the, that in capital and in Marx's writing, there is a very strong emphasis on technology and the technical character of the, the form of production that takes place. And that, that is, should always be at the center of one's analysis of the, eco and the economy in a country. What is the physical type of production and what limits does that physical type of production put on the production relations that are possible? Because there's more than one set of production relations may be possible given a certain mode of production, a certain mode of material production. Great, we have uh, two more questions from Rodrigo Santaella. Uh, what is essential in terms of understanding computer programming and mathematics so that academical and political left can incorporate the proposals of a contemporary socialist uh, planet economy? The nature of the workforce changes over time. So an increasing number of people know how to use these technologies. I don't think there is any shortage of people who know how these technologies work. And if the socialist movement um, is able to offer a convincing picture of the future, 
to technically trained young workers in the technology industries, you won't be short of people who have the skills. Okay. Uh, Rodrigo uh, continues uh, his question. On the other hand, what level of technical knowledge is necessary to make possible a direct and conscious uh, democratic participation of the population as a whole in planning decisions? Well, that I think has to come down to being able to present things in a manner that is comprehensible to people as a whole in terms of their own lives. And you can't expect people to be concerned with the, the fine details of national planning, but that you can get them to be concerned with things at an aggregate level, like if we were operating a time economy, how much of my time each week am I willing to work for changing the structure of the economy to meet uh, global warming constraints? How many hours a week am I willing to work to support health services? So if you can turn the questions into questions that are understandable to people, then I don't think the population needs any extra level of knowledge other than their the, the level of um, general experience. There is, the, this is the, the, the Aristotle's point about humans being a zoo politicon. We, we're, we're a political animal. If things are expressed in terms that people can understand, anyone is able to make a judgment. thing on the changing consumption basket well the, the, there's no problem with that formally in that the the, the the example software I've got allows you to change the consumption basket to project a consumption basket change year on year um, because it, it it doesn't say we want a single consumption basket every year it allows you to specify it separately for each individual year so that's not a problem great Okay, uh, this was uh, uh, the second uh, presentation from Automation and Digitalization in Contemporary Capitalism. The seminar is jointly organi organized by three research groups here in, in Brazil. The research group in the political economy of development from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte. The research group in economy, society and technology, NETS, from Federal University of Ceará and Digital Labor Research Lab from Unicinos University. We thank you very much, Paul Cookshot, and we wait you uh, wait you uh, um, for our next uh, keynote speakers. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye.